So, yeah, I'm going to continue today talking about the um, uh, talk about the uh, World War II. Of course, I need to, of course, talk about mostly. I'm going to review first today, getting into uh, discussing about um, like what I've already covered before. So I need to do that first, uh, and then I will, of course, talk about our main feature today, uh, which of course is on World War II. Uh, dealing with Pearl Harbor and uh, how the United States got into World War II. Uh, also talk about 1942, uh, which was the turning point year of World War II, uh, where the Allies started winning uh, against the um, Axis powers. And if I have any time, 1943, 1944, we might even go a little further and talk about some of the conflicts where the Allies started winning, you know, uh, in the war. So, yeah, let me go ahead and first talk about uh, what happened with before. We had previous class, we had talked about the rise of fascism, uh, you know, went into, uh, talked about the beginning of World War II, at least up to, I think we got up to like 1941. But the Soviet Union, um, of course, getting into the war when Ger uh, Germany attacked them. Uh, so what was the outcome of the German Revolution in 1918, 1919? Uh, well, what happened in, in Germany was that revolution broke out, which overthrew the Kaiser Wilhelm's government, Kaiser Wilhelm II. And so he was overthrown, and the Germans replaced uh, the monarchy with the Weimar Republic, uh, which was a liberal uh, democratic republic, uh, mostly run by socialists, social democrats. So the Weimar Republic was created. The uh, Weimar Republic was uh, based what they called Germany from 1919 to 33, and it was a, uh, um, like I said, a liberal republic which uh, had a um, president. They, they elected a president, uh, which was more for uh, ceremonial reasons, and they also had the chancellor still. So they had two heads of state. I guess they had uh, the president was like a ceremonial position head of the state, and then the chancellor was the head of the government. Uh, the first president of the Weimar Republic was uh, Frederick Ebert, uh, who served, I think, until 1925. And the second one, second president of Germany later was um, uh, Paul von Hindenburg, who died in 1934. Uh, what economic situations caused the decline of the Weimar Republic? Well, the Weimar Republic was uh, hurt by a lot of, um, like, uh, that the post-war depression that happened after the after the war, World War One, that was caused by the um, high debts that the uh, Germans owed after the war, uh, which killed their economy. Uh, they owed like 30, 32 billion to the Allies in war reparations. Uh, they also owed a bunch of other money, I think close to seventy billion dollars in war debts. <clears throat> Then, of course, you had the rise of the Nazis, you know, these right, uh, right wing groups that would, of course, seize power later, uh, but they also had. And that helped to also cause the decline of the Weimar as well. Uh, what is fascism? What are some components, beliefs common in the totalitarian dictatorships like that? Uh, fascism was a uh, extreme right wing political ideology uh, and movement uh, to um, create these um, extreme nationalist type states. Uh, which were ruled by totalitarian dictators, uh, guys like uh, Benito Mussolini in Italy, um, of course, Adolf Hitler in Germany. Uh, also in Japan, they became fascists as well. And uh, they are very militaristic. They wanted to rebuild the military, uh, also expand, uh, I guess, into an empire. Like uh, Italy wanted to go into Africa and become like a world power uh, again. Uh, it was it was capitalist, but it was like state controlled capitalist. Uh, but they had like a lack of democracy. A lot of the civil liberties were suspended in a lot of the fascist countries. It's been kind of compared with communism a little bit, and like the fascists, like like the Nazis, were kind of somewhat socialist a little bit. They were kind of influenced a little bit a little bit by it. Uh, they also had Francisco Franco in Spain. He was kind of considered a dictator, kind of similar to that, but it's kind of debatable about whether, you know, he was a fascist or not. Uh, he, he, he's the one that seized power in the 1930s in the so-called Spanish Civil War, uh, which broke out in Spain, which I didn't really go into, but that's what that was. Uh, but um, 
but Franco would seize power and create a totalitarian dictatorship that would control uh, Spain, but it was uh, neutral during World War II. Uh, Benito Mussolini was an Italian uh, fascist uh, and, uh, of course, prime minister of Italy. He's the one that founded the National Fascist Party in uh, Italy around 1919. Uh, he used that party to seize power uh, in Italy. What was the fasci? Where did it originate? The fasci was a um, Roman symbol. Uh, it meant bundle or bundle of rods. And it symbolized uh, the power of Roman authority over, like, in government. Uh, and um, Mussolini used it because he was trying to kind of revitalize Italy and make it into this, like, world power. Uh, that would be kind of like a modern Roman Empire-type state. And um, he used the black shirts. The black shirts, uh, which is spelled different ways, uh, the black shirts were this paramilitary organization of Mussolini uh, that he used as bodyguards. And they also uh, were used to – they were used to also, I guess, beat up anybody that was against, against him. Uh, and so what happened was in October of 1922, uh, with the threat of communism taking over uh, Italy, uh, Mussolini did this demon mass demonstration where his fascists marched on Rome and demanded that they put Mussolini in power. And so that's what the king of Italy did. Uh, and so in 1922, uh, Mussolini became prime minister. He was prime minister of Italy from 1922 to 1943. Uh, Mussolini was the one who went by that title, El Duce, which meant either the duke or the leader. And uh, so he kind of set himself up as a totalitarian dictator. Is what he ends up doing. Uh, then you have Adolf Hitler, of course. Uh, Hitler was an Austrian citizen who eventually moved to Germany uh, and was an ex-veteran of World War I. And he helped found in uh, 1919 the uh, what would later be the so-called Nazi Party, uh, as they called it, or the NSDAP, uh, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And this fascist party, of course, was very extreme, uh, uh, of course, German nationalistic type uh, organization. Uh, they're anti-Semitic, anti-communist, which pretty much all the fascists were. And uh, of course, their main symbol they adopted later was the famous uh, swastika that we talked about before. Uh, who were some leaders that were under Hitler? Uh, told you they were uh, Hermann Goering, uh, who was later uh, head of the uh, German Luftwaffe, which was their air force. Uh, he also uh, was the one that started the um, the uh, concentration camps, uh, Gehring. Uh, he, he had, then you had Heinrich Himmler, was head of the SS, you know, the black shirts. And he was also head of the Gestapo, that I talked about as well. Uh, also, I talked about uh, Ernest Rahm. He was head of the brown shirts. They called the SA, which was a paramilitary force that was originally created to protect Hitler. Uh, became this military force that paramilitary force that really uh, helped Hitler gain power and protect him. Uh, and uh, I told you Joseph, Joseph Goebbels was another figure under Hitler uh, who was um, head of like propaganda and ran like the newspapers and radio and media. And I think I talked about Martin Bormann. He was pretty important with Hitler later on. He was like Hitler's personal secretary. Also ran the Chancellery Building. Um, what was the Beer Hall push? Uh, the Beer Hall push was an attempt uh, by Hitler uh, to seize power in 1923, November 1923, in what is Munich, Bavaria, uh, which, of course, failed. You know about this. And so he ended up in prison. And, of course, when Hitler was in prison, he wrote his famous book uh, that was known as Mein Call for My Struggle. Uh, which was like an autobiography and political um, political testament about what he was going to do politically in Germany with the Nazi cause. Uh, why did the Nazis become popular in the 1930s? Uh, a lot of it was due to the Great Depression. The uh, stock market crash, of course, occurred in the United States. And so that made the message of the Nazis and Hitler very, very popular. And Hitler was a great speaker. And so that, that helped to really, you know, make him and the Nazis a great option, you know, to try and restore Germany, which uh, you had like 6 million people unemployed. Uh, so that's why people started listening to Hitler. 
Uh, Hamilton lose to the 1932 president, uh, German, German presidential election. Uh, Paul von Hindenburg, of course. But uh, if you know about it, because the Nazis did so well in the national elections, uh, what occurred was that Hitler then became chancellor in January of 1933 uh, and uh, January 30th. Uh, and um, that led to the formation of Nazi Germany or the Third Reich, uh, which would last from 1933 to 1945. Uh, was the Enabling Act of 1933. Uh, that went with the uh, Reichstag fire decree. Both those basically created like a totalitarian state with the Nazis in total power. So it became like a one state totalitarian type regime and also suspended people's uh, civil liberties. Uh, so Hitler could just basically create laws or decrees uh, to run the state, and he became a dictator. Um, Hindenburg died in 1934, and so Hitler became basically uh, the de facto leader uh, of the state under the title Führer, which meant leader, and it combined the presidency and the chancellorship together. What well, was the night of the long knives? It's called different names, but that was part of the whole Nazi blood purge or the uh, ROM purge, where they basically uh, eliminated any enemies of Hitler, including Ernest Rom, who was uh, killed, who was head of the SA. Uh, and uh, so that allowed Hitler to basically take total control of the country. Uh, why was Hitler able to rearm Germany and begin expanding the Third Reich, which happens in the 1930s? Uh, a lot of it was because the Western powers were weak. Uh, they had the League of Nations, but it really didn't do anything to stop the rise of fascism. Uh, and then um, also the uh, West wanted to use like the uh, policy of appeasement, like diplomacy to try to stop stop fascism, but it didn't work. Uh, what region of Western Germany in 1936 was reoccupied by Hitler's forces? The West didn't do anything to stop him. That was the Rhineland. They just marched in there and took it. Well, then they had the Axis powers that formed. Uh, the Axis powers, of course, were the... Um, the allies that fought together uh, in Europe and Asia uh, against the United States. Uh, these included uh, originally um, uh, uh, Germany and Italy uh, formed first, then Japan uh, was added in uh, 1940. So it started in 1936. They had the tripartite pact. And that was the deal where uh, all three of those, uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan joined. They had some other powers, like I think Hungary and Romania were in it at one point. Uh, they were kind of weaker powers, but uh, a lot of them later dropped out, including Italy. Uh, who? What was the Anschluss? Uh, Anschluss was where uh, the Nazis marched into Austria, and they annexed uh, Austria into Germany, the Third Reich, uh, which is something Hitler had wanted. What region of Czechoslovakia almost caused World War II to break out in 1938? Hitler threatens to take it. Uh, that was the Sudetenland, which was like western Czechoslovakia. Uh, and Hitler wanted that because that was a bunch of Germans living there, Sudeten Germans. And so it led to the Punic Agreement or Punic, Punic, uh, Munich Pact, uh, where the um, Western powers, Britain, France, met with Germany and Italy and Munich to decide the fate of Czechoslovakia. And so what happened was the uh, West decided to give in to Hitler's demands. And this was known as the best example of the policy of appeasement. Uh, and so they basically were kind of cowards. Uh, in the face of the Nazis, and they let Hitler take it over. And so Hitler went on from 38 to 39 to take over all Czechoslovakia, is what would happen. Uh, who was the prime minister that uh, said that there would be peace for our time when he, you know, made that uh, agreement with Hitler? Uh, that was Neville Chamberlain. And they find out that it's not really true. Of course, that ends up being wrong. What was the Nazi at Soviet non-aggression pact? Uh, it was called different names. Uh, they also call it the, um, let's see the name they dub it, the, uh, Mol uh, the Rippentrop-Molotov Pact, I think they called it. Um, that's what they dubbed it. And uh, that was a, a, a non-aggression deal where the uh, Germans and the uh, Soviets wouldn't fight war for 10 years, from 1939 to 1949. Uh, Hitler did this, of course, because he didn't want to um, have to fight a two-front war against Britain and France in the West, Soviets in the East. So he made a deal with them that he would give them half of Poland. Uh, so so basically, uh, Soviets would get the eastern part of Poland, 
Germans would get the western part. And then, and then Stalin could just take over the Baltic states, of course, which are nearby. Uh, what incident started World War II on the day of September 1st, 1939? That was, of course, Nazi Germany invading Poland, uh, which fell within a few weeks. What nickname described Germany's offensive warfare at the beginning of World War II? They called it Blitzkrieg, uh, which Blitzkrieg was a type of warfare where they used like a coordination of like uh, mechanized forces, soldiers, and of course, uh, air aircraft as well, fighters and bombers, and of course, to take out the enemy, which worked pretty effectively in the first few years of the war. What was the phony war? A phony war, of course, was this lull in the war, which lasts from 1939 to 1940. It went from the winter of uh, 1939 to the spring of 1940. Not much happened in the phony war, except the, uh, I think the um, they were kind of fighting in the Atlantic, and, and uh, I told you that uh, the Germans went into Denmark and also into uh, Norway. What region in Belgium did the Germans eventually break through? West in 1940. Uh, the Germans broke through in the Ardennes in the west, uh, which was kind of a surprise attack there. And that enabled them to eventually cut the Allies in half. It led to the uh, so-called uh, Allied pocket, which the Dunkirk, the Dunkirk pocket formed uh, in northern France and Belgium. And uh, mostly British forces, some French, got surrounded uh, by the German forces. So they had to call it the miracle of Dunkirk because the fact that um, the uh, British were able to get out most of their forces, like evacuate like something like 300,000 troops, so they could use them later to fight later. But at that point, they were losing the war in the West. Uh, then you have the Battle of France, which lasted six weeks. Uh, the Germans invaded France. France fell by mid-June 1940. Uh, what were the main surrender terms for the French who got kicked out of the war? Uh, what happened was the Germans uh, divided uh, France in half. The northern part was known as Occupied France. And then the southern part was Vichy France. B yeah, B Vichy France, which Vichy France was a pro-Nazi state that was set up on the southern part on the Mediterranean Sea with its capital of Vichy, uh, and it was led by uh, Philippe Henry Petain. He became like the president of it. They kind of supported the Nazis in the war, but later when the uh, war went bad for the for the Nazis in 1943-44, they, they switched back to the Allied side. What was the Free French or Free France? Uh, Free France was what they called the um, French government exile, which was based in London. And uh, they had included the uh, so-called Free French Forces, which were led by uh, Charles de Gaulle, who was one of their main leaders of the Free France. Uh, who becomes Prime Minister of Great Britain after Neville Chamberlain resigns? It's actually cause, caused by illness, uh, actually, but uh, kind of in disgrace, too, as well, because of the war the way it was going. Uh, that, of course, was uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, what was Operation Sea Lion? was the Battle of Britain. Uh, Battle of Britain, of course, first was a, a famous conflict where uh, Germany tried to invade Britain. It turned into a major air battle uh, between both sides. And the uh, Germans were going to attempt an uh, amphibious invasion. They called Operation Sea Lion, but um, and they never got to it. Uh, and so Battle of Britain was mostly an air battle between the Royal Air Force of the British, the German Luftwaffe, which was their air force. And of course, the RAF won. The British won. Um, and uh, the uh, RAF had a strategic advantage. Uh, they, of course, had radar, which I talked about, which was kind of important. And also, they, 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 of course, were able to, you know, fight pretty much on their own territory, either, either over Britain or in the English Channel. So the Germans had way more distance to fly. And uh, their bombers often got shot down uh, unless they bombed at night. And then when they bombed at night, they hit pretty much any kind of target. What was the Blitz in World War II? The Blitz was where basically uh, the Germans tried to bomb London and basically uh, British cities to basically knock them out of the war, uh, but the British never surrendered. What was Operation Barbarossa? That was, of course, uh, German, Nazi Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, which started in June of 1941, which involved several million uh, troops from the Axis powers. What occurred on the Eastern Front? Uh, well, um, uh, Hitler's forces 
took control of all of Poland, the Baltic states. Uh, they invaded into the Ukraine. Uh, they even they even took over Finland. Uh, they took Finland back, I think, at that point, uh, which I think the Soviets had tried to control. Uh, but Finland, Finland at one point even fought with the Nazis, I think, for a while. Uh, and then um, Leningrad was laid siege to for over two years. You know about this. Uh, but the um, Nazis failed to take, of course, Moscow, the Germans. Uh, why did it fail? It was a combination of like um, the winter, the Russian winter came on like early, uh, which helped. And then Stalin was able to get enough forces there to stop them. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, what are the Soviets called World War II? They mostly fought against the Nazis on the Eastern Front. Uh, they call it the Great Patriotic War. And uh, I told you that uh, the Eastern Front was the bloodiest front, you know, in World War II, which 20 million or more troops died, of course, in World War II. All right, moving on. Let's go, of course. We're going to, of course, next talk about, of course, how the United States got into World War II. Uh, and, um, yeah, the United States... How we got in the war, of course, had a lot to do with the uh, rise of fascism in, in Asia with Japan. Now, they were the pretty much cause of it. And, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which you saw that little short video uh, where FDR, you know, de- uh, you know announces that they're going to eventually declare war on them because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and so um, that's how we got into the war. And Japan, you know, was a world power. They, had, of course, had, you know, between World War I and World War II, uh, they had kind of started to expand as a major power and all that. And uh, in fact, before this, Japan was already in, in Korea. They controlled Korea uh, before World War I at one point. Then starting in the 1930s, uh, Japan started to expand uh, their empire uh, into uh, Manchuria, which was, which happened in 1931. Uh, they invaded just like up in the northeastern part of China now uh, today. And uh, they created actually a puppet state there known as Manchuko, uh, it was called. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing that happened with the Japanese, as you know, was in 1937, uh, Japan then attacked the Republic of China, uh, wanting to take control of the eastern part of China, like a lot of their port cities and all that. And so that led to an actual big war, which was known as the Second Sino-Japanese War, it's called, uh, which Sino is dealing with China. And um, that would break out in ni- late 1937, you know, last 1945. It actually lasted around eight years. It was actually one of the longest conflicts in the whole World War II. In fact, some some historians think that World War II started in Asia uh, originally. And a result of over 10 million deaths, like I think around 10, 10 million Chinese, but close to 10 million Chinese died, of course, uh, in World War II. And so the United States, Britain, and other powers began to send, you know, military aid to, you know, China uh, because of this. Uh, so, so that's basically how that, that of course, occurred with that. So, um, so, now, so now, you know, at this point, we perceived, you know, Japan as a major threat to us uh, overall. And so we were pretty angry about this. This happened, so of course, under Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration in the United States. So we were pretty angry about it. But uh, Japan had this idea to create this huge empire that was in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, they often called it the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And the idea was to create a Asia for Asians with the Japanese on top. You know, as the major, because I think the Japanese kind of were kind of racist like the Nazis were. They kind of used Japanese people as superior to all other Asians, and they wanted to kick out all the foreign powers and all that. So the U.S., what we we started doing, we started supporting uh, China, like militarily, giving them like military aid uh, and all that. And um, the uh, head of Jap- uh, the Republic of China was uh, Chiang Kai-shek. We started sending him arms. Uh, and all that, if you know about that, he was the uh, generalissimo, like they call it his actual title, kind of like a dictator really, of China, um, Chiang Kai-shek, later president of China, I think, back to the war. Uh, and so we, we started seeing them arms. Uh, and uh, there was a case where right before the war broke out, the United States actually sent these volunteer pilots uh, over there to fight the 
Japanese Air Force, which were actually an arm of the Chinese Air Force uh, that they had. It was called the American Volunteer Group, which was also called the so-called Flying Tigers uh, that they dubbed them. You may have heard of the Flying Tigers. I think I've got a picture right here. And the Flying Tiger was this Flying Tiger was this organization that was founded by Claire Chenault. You see there, who actually went to LSU, Louisiana State University at one point, I think for a year. He's originally from Texas, I know, was where he's from. And uh, so he got the name Flying Tigers from the fact that LSU was called the LSU Tigers. So that's the name. But they're they a volunteer organization. And over time, they became part of a Army Air Corps that fought against the um, Japanese. They're the ones that were known for their uh, airplanes that had like these uh, tiger's teeth on the front. You may have seen the so-called P-40 Warhawks. Uh, they flew. There's actually one downtown in Baton Rouge where the USS Kidd is. Like they've got one hanging up. That's a P-40 Warhawk, which the uh, Flying Tigers flew uh, and all that. So uh, anyway, just kind of talking about, you know, um, how we kind of supported the, you know, Chinese in the war, and this pretty much pretty much angered angered the uh, Japanese and all that. Well, the, the next thing that happened is they say this is the main cause of why World War II broke out with Japan. FDR decided to go further, uh, and he started putting embargoes on Japan, like selling them types of um, different uh, materials, and um, so he banned certain things like the shipment of oil and fuel to them. It's one big gasoline, things like that. We banned steel, any kind of scrap metal that they could use, you know, for their military uh, and so on, you know, building planes, planes and bombs, et cetera. And so this really put a strain on the Japanese military uh, at this point uh, in parts of Asia and parts of the Pacific. So what happened was because of this, the Japanese decided to, to retaliate against us. And attack us. And so that's why they were provoked uh, into attacking the United States, which they do in the Pacific at Pearl Harbor, uh, where our U.S. Pacific fleet was uh, in, in Oahu, Hawaii. Oahu's a little smaller island where Honolulu is, capital of Hawaii. And so this is something that they began planning. It wasn't something like real quick that they came up with. I think in the, I want to say in the fall, the um, Japanese began planning the whole operation to attack the United States. And it was done by the uh, head of the Japanese Navy, Admiral Yamamoto. He was the one that actually did a lot of the planning with this. Uh, in fact, they actually went up to the northern part of Japan. They began training uh, to attack some kind of natural harbor uh, using uh, aircraft, using bombs and torpedo bombers. Uh, and so Japanese were hoping to cripple our, our Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor and uh, have a short war, maybe six months and that's it. And that would be the end of the war. Um, however, you know, I think um, Yamamoto believed that it failed or didn't work out like they, they wanted. He didn't think that they could fight a full war with us. I think he said that it would awaken a sleeping giant was what Yamamoto said uh, about it. So that's the thing that happened next, if you know about it. Of course, the Japanese would, you know, uh, plan this whole uh, attack on Pearl Harbor that they would, of course, have, uh, that they're, of course, known for, uh, more or less. Uh, and um, so, yeah, this, you know, really a surprise attack, which it was, which we didn't know it was actually coming. Uh, and... Um, what happened was the Japanese amassed a huge carrier task force. Uh, they call it the first air fleet. It had six aircraft carriers in it. Uh, those are the actual uh, carriers that were in it. You can see there. And uh, they, they think they left Japan sometime in, uh, I want to say, late November and sailed up through the um, northern part of the Pacific Ocean to avoid any kind of major ship traffic. Uh, they would, so this whole very secretive. Uh, what the Japanese did uh, with Pearl Harbor. And so on December the 7th, which is a Sunday, 1941, uh, the Japanese, of course, task force then attacked Hawaii with a couple waves of attack planes from their carrier, carrier-based, uh, of course. And um, they wanted to try and, uh, their, their, their whole uh, object was to try and take out our airfields uh, so we wouldn't have any air power uh, to protect our fleets. 
And then, of course, they were going to go after the main Pearl Harbor fleet, of course, which was mostly at Battleship Row. They were trying to go after our main capital ships, of course, that were there. Uh, let me, of course, show you Battleship Row. Uh, here, of course, is a map of what Pearl Harbor looked like on the eve of the attack. Uh, so that's where all the ships were bored at the time. Uh, of course, the main ones you see here, these were all the main capital ships. That's where Battleship Row was, uh, which was right here. The California, Maryland, Oklahoma, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arizona, Vestal, Nevada, Nevada, uh, right here. So Arizona is, of course, most famous, which was right here. So that's where Pearl Harbor was. Um, and um, there's a natural harbor uh, that was there. In the middle, you got Ford Island was an air base uh, in the middle as well. Yeah, so these are the main ones they, they went after. Those, those are the most famous ones, really, they attacked, of course. They have other ones up there, too, you can see at the top, like Utah, Raleigh, Detroit, et cetera, uh, that are there. Uh, in the attack, which we came, like I said, in two waves, um, of course, the Americans were surprised, if you know about this. You know, they were totally surprised. Uh, in fact, they were so shocked about it that they had to send out a message telling everybody that it wasn't a drill. Like, this is no drill. In fact, they actually, at one point, people still didn't believe it. So they went out and said, this is no shit. That's what they told them. You know, this is no drill, no shit. It's real. Because uh, everybody thought, it was like, oh, it's got to be a training thing, you know, or something like that. Uh, but they ended up damaging or destroying something like 18 ships uh, or actually sunk, damaged, et cetera in the attack, and about 2,400 sailors and some soldiers were killed uh, in the attack. Uh, with the Arizona, by the way, Arizona was about half the, the people killed. About 1,200 men were killed on the Arizona, uh, which was pretty much totally destroyed. Uh, and also the Oklahoma was pretty much destroyed and sunk uh, as well uh, in the attack. I've got pictures, of course, showing uh, here, of course, is the uh, actual deployment of the Japanese attack waves of aircraft uh, that came in. You can see the attack came in about 7.55, the first wave, and the second wave came in about an hour later. So you see a lot of the fighters first went after the airfields to take out our aircraft first, and then, of course, after that, they brought in the dive bombers and torpedo bombers, uh, which attacked our fleet, uh, more or less. Uh, these are pictures, of course, showing, kind of depicting, actually, that was taken from one of the Japanese aircraft uh, that was over, of course, at the time on December 7th, you're looking at, uh, which is right there. Uh, there's the Arizona exploding. Uh, there's a myth that the uh, bomb went, like a bomb went down the smokestack. Actually, it hit the magazine, blew up, and the Arizona actually literally came out of the water when it exploded. That, of course, is the color picture because originally in black and white. Uh, the Arizona would burn almost till Christmas time. It burned for a long, long time. Uh, so most of the crew there, you know, like I said, died. Like 80% of the crew was, were killed in the actual attack. Um, there's the Maryland on the left, but the Oklahoma's right here. You can kind of see it with its keel turned up. It actually turned turtle, uh, it capsized and turned over. And uh, they actually had men trapped inside of it uh, until Christmas time. They were banging on the hole trying to get out. And by the time they got men to them, they were dead. Uh, USS Shaw might have been the most spectacular explosion, which blew up, uh, which was actually just a ship that was in dry dock. Uh, but it exploded in, in, into a huge fireball. So basically with the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, the United States, you know, the next day declared war on Japan. We declared war on them on December 8th, uh, 1941. And of course, I showed you that video earlier uh, by um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, you know, talking about the uh, day of infamy, you know, and that is a dastardly attack is I think what he would eventually say uh, about it. Uh, and so we would declare war on them. Uh, and then uh, what happened next, because we, we declared war on Japan, uh, you know, because of the tripartite pact uh, in 1940. Uh, what ends up happening is the Axis powers, three days later, December 11th, declare war on us. So the United States is now at, at war with Japan, Germany, of course, and also Italy. 
So that's how the United States, you know, gets in the war uh, and all that uh, because of the attack on 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 Pearl Harbor. So, so yeah, about twenty, almost twenty four hundred men were killed, you know, in the attack. That's a good amount. That's you know, I forget what what nine eleven was like three three thousand. And so, yeah, we don't really have an attack like that until 9-11 that somebody attacks us, you know, which is 60 years later. Interesting about that. Uh, oh, of course, 60 years later. All right. I need to go ahead and move on. I need the next, of course, talk about uh, what happened, of course, in 1942. Uh, so we need to kind of talk about next uh, what occurred. With that, now, uh, 1942, 42 was the, 1942 was the turning point year of World War II. That's when basically the Allies started really winning against the Axis powers, uh, more or less. And uh, there was a lot of different turning point battles that were pretty important uh, in the war. Uh, they had one called the Battle or Battles of El Alamein. These are the second ones more famous that happened in October of 1942. Uh, that one's real famous, of course. That was considered one of the first big turning point battles. And that took place in the North African front, which I'll get to a little today and talk about. Uh, then they had the Battle of Stalingrad, of course, on the Eastern Front, where the Soviet Union was fighting Germany and the Axis powers. Uh, that was considered the most strategic battle of all of World War II, uh, pretty much. Uh, and then, of course, Japan, of course, you know, we had the Battle of Midway. Uh, which happened, I think, around June of 1942. Uh, that one actually occurred first, really, uh, that one. which I'll get to that one later when I get to the Pacific War. That one was actually our big turning point battle against the Japanese, all that. Now, what happened was in the North African front, this happened like mostly 1940 to 43. Uh, Hitler decided to try and take over North Africa because uh, he wanted to take control of like the Suez Canal. Uh, and then we can get the Suez Canal. He could then control a lot of the trade networks in that area from east to west. Then he could have access to oil as well uh, in that region. And so uh, it started really back with Italy. Italy had already controlled part of Libya, you know, going back to Mussolini. Uh, and uh, what happened was Italy around 1940 attacked Egypt, but they got beat by the British. They didn't do so well. And so what happened, Hitler decided to intervene, and he sends in this general, Erwin Rommel, uh, to try to aid uh, the Italians in North Africa and maybe try to see if they could take over Egypt. And so Rommel goes in there, and he forms what is called the Africa Corps. I think I've got a picture of Rommel uh, to show you right here. He was nicknamed the Desert Fox, uh, and... Um, there's Rommel right there, a uh, picture of him. And, uh, yeah, Rommel uh, was the commander of the Africa Corps, one of its main generals. And, um, of course, it didn't do well, you know, in the end. But uh, Rommel was a pretty good general. A lot of the uh, generals in the West, like U.S. and British, thought he was one of their, their best generals uh, overall. Probably not true, but it, but, but I think a lot of people thought he was. And uh, anyway, he was called the Desert Fox because he was good at desert warfare. And the Africa Corps was a uh, mechanized type army, which was composed of German and Italians. It was actually both of them together uh, fighting. And at first he was successful, like between 1942 and 43, he was actually successful early in the war, like maybe for about a year. And uh, what happened was Rama was able to actually take control of eastern Libya, uh, the city of Tobruk. Uh, which had been controlled by the British. British had taken it from, I think, uh, from Mussolini. Uh, he took it back. Uh, and then from there, he was able to drive into Egypt, like into the northern part of Egypt. And so that led to the battles of El Alamein, uh, which uh, the most strategic one they fought, of course, was the second one, the second battle of El Alamein, which was fought between October and November of 1942. Uh, and... Um, both sides, the German and British, fought for control over El Alamein, which is this like port city that's on the Mediterranean Sea. And it has like vital um, rail links that would link it to like Cairo to the south and all that, and probably Alexandria. Uh, and so if Rommel could take that, that would have been a big blow. 
uh, to the British, and then maybe Egypt would have fallen uh, at that point. Uh, well, on the British side, they had a general uh, who eventually was put in command uh, who was known as Bernard Montgomery, who they called Bonte, or some people also call him the Spartan general as well. And um, Monty eventually headed up what became known as the um, British Eighth Army, uh, which was sometimes called the Desert Rats. I think is what they called them, I believe, because uh, they were fighting Rama, who's the Desert Fox, if you get that. And uh, he was very affectionate, but he was kind of flamboyant. Uh, he, he was kind of like uh, he and Patton didn't got into it a lot, if you know about that. He was an American general, didn't like each other too much. And um, But Monty, Monty was a pretty good general. He's a good general of tank warfare and all that uh, as well, like, like um, Rommel was. Uh, severely outnumbered by the British. The British had more armor, which, uh, well, some of it came from us from the United States. We gave them some aid armor-wise. They had more troops, more armor uh, than Rommel's Africa, of course. And they got routed. They got beat badly uh, in at, at the Second Battle of Al Alamein. And it sent Rommel's forces reeling back towards Libya. They got pushed back into Libya and then eventually got pushed back into Tunisia and part of um, also Algeria at one point. And so from 1942 to 43, Rommel's forces started losing uh, in North Africa. And then another thing that happened too, it's very, very famous uh, in the war, was the United States got into uh, to World War II uh, as well. So-called Operation Torch, uh, they called it. Uh, we came in November of 1942 uh, under the command of Dwight D. Eisenhower and George S. Patton. We invaded um, what is Morocco and Algeria, uh, which were actually held by the Vichy French, uh, who supported the Nazis uh, from 1940 to about 42, 43. And um, they realized that the Germans were starting to lose the war, 42, 43, and so they eventually switched sides. Uh, is what happened. Uh, and uh, we were able to seize control of um, Morocco in Algeria. It was like an amphibious invasion. Uh, and so that was very important. Uh, Eisenhower's forces with mostly Patton. Patton was supposedly the genius uh, here in North Africa. Patton's forces, uh, he was also called uh, Old Blood and Guts, they called him. His forces were able to eventually help the British trap Rommel's forces uh, in what is Tunisia. And eventually by 1943, the um, Rommel's forces was forced to surrender uh, in May. Actually, that should be May of 43, not 42. That's actually wrong. Let me fix that right there. So there's a typo there. But that should be May of um, 1943. Uh, when uh, they would surrender something like 300,000 troops, which is quite a lot, you know, that could have fought against the Allies. And um, Rommel fled. He fled. He left his troops behind, you know, pretty much. He went back to help Hitler with the Atlantic Wall to try and defend uh, France from being invaded later. And uh, so that was really the first blow. You know, if you think about, you know, uh, what happened in the West anyway uh, with the Axis powers losing control of North Africa, which I don't think that really ever was going to really happen. You know, I think I think that Hitler was, like I said, it was like a losing war, you know, trying to basically fight, uh, you know, over there. So Operation Torch. Uh, now, they also had what they call Operation Husky, which I also need to talk about uh, as well. So after that happened, um, we're going to get to, I, I need to get to that, but I need to also talk about, I forgot about Stalingrad. I need to go back and talk about that first before I can talk about Husky as well. We need to go back and get to that. I didn't get to Stalingrad. So let me talk about that real quick and I'll come back and get to that. Now, Stalingrad first um, was pretty important. Uh, that um, was part of a second offensive by Hitler to try and take over southwestern Russia, which had a lot of oil fields, where, where Baku is, you know, where that is. And Hitler wanted to take control of uh, Stalingrad, which was on the Volga River. Uh, and, um, and so it was all part of an offensive that was called Case Blue. It was like a summer offensive, which was like a continuation of Operation Barbarossa. 
And so um, he believed if he could take Stalingrad, which had, you know, Stalin's name in it, uh, you know, that would lead eventually to um, that part of Russia falling. And then maybe after that, he would take Moscow, uh, was the theory. Or some people think he should have taken Moscow. And so, yeah, by the uh, summer of 1942, uh, the Germans actually took the city of Stalingrad uh, on the Volga. Uh, but Stalin uh, sent in reinforcements uh, to try to, to basically, you know, kick them out. And it led to this urbanized warfare, house-to-house -house fighting, which, you know, Stalingrad is, is, of course, known for. Stalingrad became one of the bloodiest, you know, battles in, in World War II and, and probably in history. Uh, overall, like close to 2 million men were killed and wounded uh, in the Battle of Stalingrad, which would last something like six months or more. Uh, and over time, what happened was by the winter of, um, by the winter of um, November 1942, uh, the Soviets got, um, were able to eventually sur uh, surround uh, the German forces that were actually in Stalingrad which was mostly composed of the German Sixth Army, led by this gentleman named Frederick von Paulus, uh, in part of an operation called Operation Uranus. And uh, they were able to do this because of the fact that the uh, Volga River had frozen over in the winter, and so the Soviet forces were able to kind of counterattack on the left and right flanks, and they basically encircled it. Uh, and uh, what happened was eventually um, Paulus was forced to surrender, Hitler was furious about it. Uh, he didn't want to give up. Uh, and so he got captured. And Paulus was like the only German field marshal that was actually captured in the war. So the German defeat uh, at Stalingrad was pretty severe. It was considered to be the big turning point of, of all of World War II. Uh, if you read about it, and they never recovered from it. The, the Nazi Germans never recovered from you know, Stalingrad's defeat. You know, and everybody knew it later. Uh, in Germany even. And from there, the Soviets start pushing them back uh, through Poland and all that. Uh, and so they'll eventually lose the war because of what happened, of course, with Stalingrad. Right, yeah, let me also talk about what I was going to get to, which was Operation, we talked about Operation Torch. Let me talk about Operation Husky, uh, what, what that was. Uh, Operation Husky um, was a uh, was Allied invasion of Italy that started with Sicily at first. Uh, and um, the idea to go into Italy was an idea of the British. I think Churchill came up with the idea. He thought that if they could attack through Italy, uh, they could basically, you know, invade Nazi Germany through its underbelly. That was the idea of it. So that's how the whole Italian campaign started in the summer of 1943. It started with Operation Husky first, which was actually the invasion of Sicily, which involved mostly American and British forces, which used amphibious invasions with this. And um, what happened was under General Patton, he led the American forces and Montgomery led the British forces. Uh, they basically attacked the southern part of the island. And what happened was the Italian and German forces realized they couldn't hold the island. And so they retreated uh, to the Italian mainland. This went over like a period of like a few weeks. Uh, it fell. And um, eventually it led to the Americans and the other allies, British, etc., landing at Salerno, Salerno uh, in September of 1943. Uh, and um, because of this whole thing with the allies taking Sicily, Mussolini was so embarrassed about it that it, they had failed to stop him uh, that he resigned. Uh, his prime minister, he stepped down uh, at that point. And Mussolini, um, his fall from power, you know, would later lead to the Italians switching to the Allied side during the war. Uh, they didn't want to stay with the Axis powers anymore because they realized Hitler was losing the war. Uh, and so uh, they thought Hitler would withdraw uh, his forces, but he didn't want to. He refused to do it. Uh, he wanted to try to stall and prevent the, you know, the allies from invading through Germany, through Italy. Uh, and so that's that's what led to the whole Italian campaign starting, which would last from 1943 uh, to 1945. 
Uh, the Allied, this is a kind of a strange uh, conflict, by the way, the Italian campaign. It was actually composed of multiple nationalities from like all over the world uh, that fought, even from like India and so on, fought uh, in the war. They had like Japanese American forces. There were even African American troops, if you know about this, that fought in Italy in the Italian campaign. And um, part of why it was like a lot of the elitist forces that they had, that you've been using already, were actually sent to like Britain, where they were going to attack into France, where the Allied invasion of France and all that. And so they used all these other forces. Uh, and uh, the Allies fought against General Albert Kesselring. He was called Smiling Albert, they called him. He was actually an Air Force general. who actually turned out to be pretty good. <laughs> he was a pretty good general, Kesselring. Uh, and um, we were pretty respected. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, the um, the uh, Italian campaign was uh, very difficult uh, because of the terrain of Italy. And uh, Kesselring used like the mountains and hills of Italy to slow down uh, the Allies. And uh, probably the most strategic battle of the whole Italian campaign was the uh, Battle of Monte Cassino, uh, which took place right before uh, the fall of Rome, like from January to May of 1944. And uh, that eventually led to uh, uh, the Allies taking Rome, which fell on June 4th, 1944. And uh, the um, Rome was the first actual Axis capital to fall to the Allies. Uh, it was uh, before they had the fall of, you know, um, Berlin and I guess in Tokyo later. Uh, but like I said, the Italian campaign would drag on. It would drag on to like May of 1945. Close to a million men were killed and wounded uh, on both sides. And uh, people sometimes later called it the so-called Forgotten War because the Allies started, you know, going into France, like invading France. And they were still fighting there. And it was really kind of almost inconclusive, uh, that campaign for like a bunch of months before they pushed Kelsel Ring up into like northern Italy and all that. So that was the whole, you know, uh, Italian campaign, of course, that occurred. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, yeah, of course, the Mussolini would later be killed at the end of the war. He was later shot by partisans and all that. Uh, and so he would actually be murdered, uh, assassinated pretty much at the end of the war. Now, I'm going to get to it later, but it looks like we're running out of time today. But I am going to be, of course, talking about next which what happens with the Allied invasion of D of, of D Day of, of Normandy, uh, of course, the so-called Allied invasion of of France, uh, as they called it. It's called all kinds of names, usually D Day for short. And uh, so I'll be talking about that uh, on our next lecture uh, on uh, on Thursday, uh, and then I'll, of course I'll, I'll talk about the end of World War II uh, as well. I'll talk about the the war in I'll talk about how the war ends in Germany. Uh, with Germany being taken, uh, and then of course I'll get into the Japanese conflict with the Pacific Pacific War uh, as well. Uh, so that's pretty much it for today. Uh, before y'all go, don't forget, um, you know, I do have reminders uh, that I've got uh, I've posted, of course, already. I think you've got the vocab, the main thing left you have to do. And if anybody's doing the Veterans Project, don't forget, you know, about that as well. So I am working on the final right now, trying to wrap that up. So I am going to be posting this lecture later to my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions about the lecture, let me know about it. If you have any uh, administrative questions, just email me from the email address you have already uh, for that. So that's it for today. I'll have another lecture on Thursday, continuing and try to wrap up World War II uh, overall. So that's it for today. So y'all take care.